We're in 2 Kings. As we're doing a survey, just a little, little review. We did Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy called the Pentateuch. And we were introduced to Noah. And then we are introduced to people like Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Joseph, and then Moses. And then Moses' successor started our trip into the historical books, the next 12 books, starting with Joshua. And we looked at Joshua, and we looked at Judges, and then we looked at Ruth, and then we looked at First and Second Samuel. Remember, First Samuel's were introduced to our first king, our last judge, Samuel, and our first king, Saul. And then he is the main story of First Samuel. Even though David's intertwined in that story, then Second Samuel, Saul's died. At the end of First Samuel, Saul and Jonathan, and then David became the, the main emphasis. And David unites the kingdom. And he's victorious and he's winning land over. And remember, David had a desire to build the temple. And God says, no, not you. Your son Solomon will. And so David, there at the beginning of First Kings, uh, David is on his deathbed and proclaims Solomon as king. And the first 10 chapters of First Kings was about Solomon. And then we have, a, we have a united kingdom, but then as Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam takes over and we get a divided kingdom. Rehoboam takes over the southern kingdom to, to Judah and Benjamin. And then Jeroboam takes over the northern kingdom of 10 tribes. And then we start our trail of 39 kings as we go through First and Second Kings and in First and Second Chronicles. And uh, 39 kings, eight of those 39 kings are do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. 31 will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. No king that sits on the throne of the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes, will be a good king. Only those eight will be in the southern tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And that's what will be known in the scripture. You'll read it says Israel and it'll say Judah. And that's the two divisions, the north and the south. And then as we continue our journey in the kings, we'll see that as we get to the end of 2 Kings, toward the end of the book, we'll see the end of the tribes of Israel in the land. They will be taken captive in 722 B.C. by Assyria. 136 years later, in 586 B.C., we see Judah will be taken captive by Babylon. And so that's kind of a little overview of where we've been and where we're heading. As we finish up 2 Kings today, we started there last week uh, in 2 Kings and got partway through. And uh, the statement is this, God keeps his word. When you study the Old Testament, you see that God is faithful to his word. God says, if you're obedient, you will be blessed. If you're disobedient, you will be cursed or you'll be punished. And that's what's happened to these nations. They decide that they're not going to do what God asked them to do in that covenant that God made with them. And they said, we'll do it, but they don't. And then God will judge them and they will go into captivity. So that's what you see on this message from compromise to captivity. And as I've shared, and I'll share again and again, I see it going into effect in our nation. I watch them move away from the principles of God, and we're going into captivity. One day our nation will cease to exist. I still stand that I don't believe we're in prophecy, in the end time prophecy, because we will not be a nation any longer because of compromise. And we've compromised compromised our stand with God and one nation under God is no longer one nation under God and uh, so I, I believe we're under judgment of God and we'll continue to do that uh, we looked at during the dark times God always has some light and that had Elijah we looked at him last week Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire in a whirlwind a picture I believe of the rapture and Elijah and one other person, remember, never faced death. Enoch, Genesis. Enoch walked with God and he was not. 
And uh, so we have two there. That's why some, as I shared last time, some believe the two prophets in the end time events in Revelation are Enoch and Elijah. Because the Bible says is that appointed unto men once to die, then a judgment. I still hold that it's Elijah and, and Moses, but uh, that's why some people think that. And, and you're free to think either one, uh, because you know what? Not all of us are going to die. If we're here when the rapture takes place, we won't face death. So we'll see what happens there. Maybe that's a picture in that too. Then Elijah's taken up and God gives us Elijah. <laughs> and uh, so we have light and guys proclaiming righteousness. And these guys weren't afraid to stand up to kings and tell them where they're doing and what they're doing is wrong. And so that's kind of, we covered those things. And then we looked at a crazy guy named Jehu, who was a crazy driver. I told you, I said, I think he was a pastor. Because pastors have bad reputations for being crazy drivers. I would be, but my wife won't let me. And, and uh, no, I know uh, uh, I'm, I'm crazier than she is, but I'm not quite, uh, I'm not too bad a driver. Uh, yet. Uh, but uh, God, Jehu was God's choice to wipe out the line of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, that first king, his family was evil. And the kings of that were evil, and, and he will do that. We looked at that last week, and of course his wife was, uh, Jezebel's death was even more grisly than her husband's, and we, we looked at those things. And we, we got to, on your outline, point D, we quickly had looked at Queen Athalia of Judah, and uh, she died, and the death of her son uh, uh, Ahaziah cleared the way for Athalia to declare herself queen, and she slaughtered all the rightful heirs to David's throne, except for one. And then uh, Jehosheba took Joash and hid him for six years. And then he will become king at age seven. And the queen was executed. See, God had a line that he protected all the way through. And that line was the line of David, because through that line, guess what? The Messiah would come. So God protected that group. And uh, so we see God at work there. Even when he's not mentioned, he's at work doing those things. And then Joash uh, starts a line of four kings that are good kings, and they'll last for a hundred years. Four good kings, and that will be uh, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, or Uzziah, and Jotham. And they'll last, uh, that's the longest reign of good kings in Israel's history 100 years. And Joash died at the hand of assassins. His son Amaziah succeeded him. And we're in chapter 13 now, and that's where we left off last week. In chapter 13, Chapter 12, Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. And in the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 17 years. And here's that wonderful phrase. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse, verse 2. And he followed the sins of Jeroboam. Remember, that's the first king in the northern. And remember, Jeroboam set up calves to worship so the people wouldn't go to Jerusalem and worship like God had, had required. And uh, so he did that. And he and, and it'll often make that reference for you. And Jehoaz uh, was Jehu's son. He followed the sins of his of his grandfather and he used and, and God used the Arameans to chat, chastise the Israelites under his reign. Then in verse 10 we pick up these go through fairly quick as is on your outline. They go quick. You're not going to remember half of these guys. Some of them you will, some of them you won't. But at least you've heard them one time. 
<laughs> and, uh, and, and some of them you might want to go back and read because there's some pretty interesting stories in there that we don't have time to cover in this kind of series. And so uh, his, next we have Jehoash of Israel in verse 10. Uh, you see there in verse 9 it gives that name and I circle it in my Bible so that I remember where I'm at. And verses 10 through 13 we see uh, he is also called Joash. But in verse 11, guess what? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And remember, uh, when you do evil in the sight of the Lord, you can't expect to be blessed. And, and, and it shows it over and again. Amaziah, uh, I mean, uh, Elijah died during his reign. And uh, Elisha died during his reign. But he also gave... gave um, a, a prophecy that they would have victory against the Arameans. But if this guy would have followed what he should have done, he could have had more victories. But it didn't. And you'll have to read that story. It's all about shooting an arrow and about those things. You, you'll have to read to check that up. Amaziah of Judah. Uh, I do want to go back one verse. Elijah, Elijah was quite a prophet. Now, you can read about Elisha, and you'll find at one time you should never make fun of bald people. I don't see any bald people. Oh, yeah, I see one a little bit bald. But uh, Elijah, they were, the, the, the kids were making fun of him. Guess what? Elijah called down a bear on him. <laughs> he took a bunch of them out. But I, I don't know that that's going to happen. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Elijah was buried they had, it says in verse 20 of chapter 13, then Elijah died and they buried him and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. See, when the, these kings did evil, God allowed the other nations to come in and, and they were just taken over. And, uh, and says, so it was that they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elijah and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elijah, guess what? He revived the stone on his feet. Would you like to have been there for that one? Throw that guy in, all of a sudden he stands up and looks at you. Whoa, that's, and that was before TV, folks. So that was, I mean, this is pretty bizarre stuff. But that was the power that God had invested in Elijah, his prophet. And, and, uh, uh, and it's also a picture to me that just as Jesus Christ rose from the dead, guess what? He has the power to raise every one of us from the dead if, if we, we travel that path. And so that's a little bit there. Was kinda, and then we get Amaziah. He, in chapter 14, in verse 1, and we get him 1 through 14. On your outline it says 1 through 4. That is incorrect. It's supposed to be 1 through 14. And in the second year of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, became king. And he'll reign 29 years. And verse 3 gives us that thought again. Here's the second king. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But it tells us also there... Uh, Verse 4, however, the high places were not taken away and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So we still got idolatry and all that stuff going on, even though the king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And sometimes the nation reflects the king's character and sometimes they don't. Um, but God will honor uh, Amaziah's. And, and Amaziah is assassinated, verse 19, and they formed a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. And so his son Azariah succeeded him. Now we flip back to Israel. We kind of get this flip-flop around until Israel's out of the picture. Like his namesake, jo Jeroboam II, in ver chapter 14, verse 23, we get Jeroboam. So, like I said, sometimes you get kings named after the same line and all this, so it's kind of hard to keep up with them. But anyhow, Jeroboam uh, in verse 24 says, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, that doesn't change in north, in Israel. 
in Judah, we have good ones going on right now. And in Judah, it's a family line that runs through. In Israel, it's all over the place. Most of them are killed or assassinated, and, they, and some of their, their reign is very short. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who, made Israel, who had made Israel sin. Over and over, you'll read that phrase about those. They, they, they didn't get away from the idolatry and the worship of, uh, incorrectly of the Lord. And then um, next, we go back now to Judah. Chapter 15, verse 1. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Jeroboam the second, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. And he was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years. Second longest reign of any king, 52 years. We're going to have one that's going to go 55 years. But one thing about this king that's different than the 55 years, this one did, verse 3, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Second Chronicles tells, tells us, though, that he had a little problem with, growth, with pride. And 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 23, and he did something that the priest was supposed to do, and God struck him with leprosy. So watch out. Even though he was someone that did right in the eyes of the Lord, he still had some issues that he needed to deal with. And God always deals with those. <clears throat> we get a couple more kings. We flip back to Israel now, the ten northern tribes. Chapter 15, verses 8 through 22, we get three guys. Zechariah, Shalem, and Menahem. <laughs> Zechariah, jo Jeroboam's second son, or his son, ruled only six months before he was murdered by Shalem, who reigned only one month before he was assassinated by Menahem. Menahem was an evil, vicious king. Evil, vicious king. Uh, uh, Let's see, I'm going to get where it says. Oh, right, verse 18. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 18, chapter 15. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did not depart all the days from his sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. There's that phrase again. So we got three kings, a little bit of time. Uh, and then after that, we get his son, uh, Pekiah, in chapter 15, verse 23. In the 50th year, of Azariah, king of Judah. He's going to be there 52 years. Pekiah, the son of Menahem, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned two years. And there's our phrase again. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart. And then after he dies, his son will take over. <coughs> Pekah, verse 25. Then Pekah, the son of Remaliah, an officer of his, Conspired, no, it wasn't his son. I'm sorry, that's an officer. Conspired against him and killed him in Samaria in the citadel of the king. So here we got short reigns again. Pekah's wicked reign lasted 20 years. The king of Assyria plundered many of the cities during his reign, even deporting some of the Israelites to Assyria. God had taken down their protective border. God had protected his nation. Now they've sinned and they keep on sinning. They keep on moving away and God judges them. And so uh, then it switches back for just a moment again to Judah, Azariah, uh, Jotham of Judah, Azariah's son, uh, completes the grouping of four good kings that I told you about that last for 100 years. And that's in verse 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, See, they call him Azariah in one part, and they call him Uzziah in another. That's why I gave you both. King of Judah began to reign. He was 25 years old, and he became king. And verse 34, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So that's the fourth king now that we've had doing right in the eyes of the Lord. And then we get Ahaz, chapter 16. Looks like after four, we're going to lose it, lose the streak. Chapter four or chapter sixteen, verses one through twenty, we have Ahaz of Judah in the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah. Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. 
Ahaz was 20 years old, verse 2, when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, as if you read on down. He walked in the ways. He also formed an unhealthy alliance with the king of Assyria, which opened the door for enemy invasion. After his 16-year reign, his son Hezekiah succeeded him. So we get 16 years of evil again, now in the southern kingdom. So we got a northern kingdom, evil. Southern kingdom, evil. And then we get Hoshea, the last king of Israel. God's finally said, I had enough. You, just, you never know when God cuts it off. But when God says he's had enough, he's had enough. And uh, so in chapter 17, it says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel. And he did, verse 2, evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Then Shalmaneser will come in and take him out in 722 B.C. And the Lord says in chapter 17 or chapter 18, verse 12, this is why. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that the Moses, that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. And here, here's the phrase. They would neither hear nor do them. When they were told what to do right, guess what? They closed their ears. We don't want to hear it. We do not want to hear it. We're not going to do it. And we don't even want to hear about it. Sounds like someone else I know right now in America today. People don't want to hear it. <laughs> They're not going to do it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to have no part of it. They don't want you saying it either. And they call it whatever they want. You're judging people. Do not judge lest you be judged. Better read that scripture and finish out what it says there. It says, get the plank out of your eye, then deal with the situation. Sin is sin. And I don't care what anybody says. I just had a guy ask me the other day, what are you going to do when you can't preach against homosexuality? I said, I'm still going to preach against homosexuality. What happened? They throw you in jail. I said, I'm still going to preach against homosexuality because God says it's sin. Abortion. I'm going to keep on saying it's wrong. It's a sin. And God will judge a nation. We're going to see he judges a king who does that to his son. It sends him through a fire. But these nations, it said, and so the Syrians come in and they take these people and they take them out of their nation. Then they take another nation's people and they bring them into Israel. And they try to do this to reorient them to their way of thinking and their way of living. Well, they came under judgment, so the Syrian king asked for a priest to come and teach the people the ways of God so they would appease him. Chapter 17, verse 41 says this about him. Chapter 17, verse 41. So these nations feared the Lord. All right. No. Read the rest. Yet served their carved images also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their father did even to this day. Syncretism. They mix God with their God. And they had many gods. That never works. It doesn't work. And they passed on those things. They were idol worshipers. They worshipped many gods. They offered things under all uh, the trees and the heavens. And God will judge that. And that's what he did. So for their disobedient, God takes them out of the land. And Assyria now is in control of that. You would think that Judah, watching the northern kingdom and the path they walked in, would learn, don't go that way. It's not going to happen. It's sad. Then we get... In chapters 18 through 25 on your outline, we get an emphasis on the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, and the king there. And we're going to get Hezekiah. During Judah's history, you'll see it gets dark, but then God sends some light in. Hezekiah is one of those. He's a good guy. Hezekiah chapter 18 
It says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the last king of Israel, uh, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Verse 3, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father, who? Now David wasn't his father. He was his ancestor. But he did, he had a heart like David. Remember what David's heart? David had a heart that pleased God. He was a man after God's own heart. And this is the kind of guy. And uh, it says in verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, listen, look, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor were before him. Verse 6, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Isn't that something? The son of an evil king, guess what? Exactly the opposite. You see it happening. You see it happen in good families and in bad families. Somebody you think would never grow up to be a godly person ends up to be such a godly man used by God or a godly woman. Don't want to leave that out. And then also, we see those that come from good families that turn bad. Again, remember, we can do everything we can, but uh, people still have a, a, a part in their destiny. You have choices to make. And God, under God's sovereign control, <laughs> it all takes place. Just because they came from a good family doesn't mean they'll turn out good. And just because they came from a bad family, that's, that's good on the bad side. There's always hope for everybody. But uh, anyhow, there we go. Hezekiah. He purged the land of idols. He took out all the high places. And his faith in God, and there's a great story, you read that sometime, about how he fell before God and pleaded that the nation of Assyria would not come in and take over. Because the Assyrian king had said, you're done for. And he, he sends in people with propaganda. He says, don't you believe what that Hezekiah says? He says he trusted his God, that God. We beat all the gods everywhere we go. That's what they basically said. Hezekiah threw those words up. The Lord said, don't let those words come true. And God protected them. As a reward for his dependence on God later, the prophet comes and said, hey, Hezekiah, get your family in order. It's over. <laughs> and you know what? Hezekiah should have said, okay. I really believe he should have said, okay, but he didn't. He didn't do that. He asked the Lord to give him more time. And the Lord gives him 15 years. But so to do that, he, the Lord says, do you want a sign? And he says, yes. He says, do you want the clock to go ahead or do you want to move back? He says, well, it's easy for the clock to go ahead. I want it to move back. And so the sundial actually moves back. And it's pretty important because as people tried to figure out the times from eternity past up to now, whenever there was doing that, they couldn't get the clock to line up quite right. You know why? Because God messed them up. <laughs> God moved it back. God moved it back that little bit. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, there we go. But an instance of pride again brought a prediction of Babylonian captivity, but not in Hezekiah's lifetime. And I don't know what changed, but now we get his son, Manasseh. Here's the 55-year reign. And that starts in chapter 21. And I skipped you some chapters that you'll have to go in and fill in the gaps. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Some is hard. Their names are hard. God knows what their names are. So you don't have to worry about it if you can't say them right. Uh, it says in chapter 20, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Sad, verse 2. Now his dad had set everything right, so he undoes everything that his dad did. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And you know what that abomination is? Sending their kids into the fire to offer them as a sacrifice to their gods. I believe today no different than the sin of abortion. Millions, millions, millions of babies being aborted 
God will not bless that and he will, he will deal with that. One of the reasons I believe our nation is, is, is under judgment. He may have been the worst king in both Israel and Judah's history. Now, he's in the good line in Judah. He undid all they good. He built the, the high places. He practiced witchcraft. He consulted mediums. He even offered his son, verse 6, also he made his son to pass through the fire. He was willing to sacrifice his old son in the fire to appease the gods of the land. His bloody rule lasted longer than any other king. Then his son, next one, chapter 21, verse 19, we get his son Ammon, or Ammon, depends on who you're listening to, was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years. And he followed in his dad's footsteps, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he will be killed by his officials. Think things all dark, and then guess what? God sends another good one. Chapter 22 and verses through 23, 30, we get Josiah. He was eight years old and he reigned 31 years. And verse 2 says, And he did what was right in his sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. I would love to have that written behind my name. He did not turn aside to the left hand or to the right. He just kept on going the straight and narrow road. Remember, the, the Lord said, narrow is the path and broad is the path to destruction. Narrow is the path to life. And he, he walked on it. And uh, he, will, uh, he will reinstate the Passover. None of these kings have been doing the Passover. Remember what the Passover is. Remember, remember that's the Passover lamb. They put the blood on the lamppost. And matter of fact, that's what Jesus partook, partook in the Passover before he instituted the Lord's Supper. And uh, they, they celebrated the angel of the Lord passing over those families because the blood that was on the doorpost and on the lintel. And uh, it says in um, 23, chapter 23 and verse 21, and, and again, this is after he got a hold of the word, got a hold of the word, and uh, uh, and it got a hold of him. And in verse 21, it said, Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. And here's what it says. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. So it was the largest Passover celebration ever since the kings had taken over. That's what happens when the word gets a hold of your heart. It changes the way you do things. It helps us see things from the way that God sees them. He tore the idols down, got rid of the corrupt priests and mediums. And he dies in battle against Pharaoh of Necho, chapter 23, verse 29. And we get the last four kings. None of, no more good ones. Judah had four more kings, Jeho Jehoaz, chapter 23, verse 31. And I, I just circled those, so then in my Bible, I, I, I know where they're at. Jehoaz took, was 23 years old when he became king, and he's going to reign a whopping three months. Then Jehoiakim, his son, in verse 34 it's not going to get verse 34. It's 20, yeah, 23, verse 34. Yeah, there we are. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father. So now we have a king, Pharaoh Necho, making Josiah the king, or, uh, and uh, uh, Jehoiakim king, and then he will... Uh, betray his trust with that king, Pharaoh of Necho, and then he will be taken there and die in captivity. And then Jehoiakim, his son, takes over, and he was deported, uh, and uh, Jehoiakim rebelled against Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar, causing the king and several other enemy nations to attack Jerusalem. So then we have Zedekiah, one of the saddest stories. Zedekiah will see his sons paraded in front of him, and they gouge his eyes out. 
and then take him to the, the Babylonians. 12 o'clock. It is uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were, and the Assyrians were evil people. They did wicked things to people. They would come into towns and they would rip women's wounds open and leave them laying on the street. They would take babies and impale them and ride around on with them on their horses. They would skin people alive. They would hang them up and skin them and set them on fire. All these kind of things. They were evil, evil. Nebuchadnezzar and the king of Assyria were evil, evil people. And people hated and, and they feared them. See, they ruled by fear. And people were afraid to stand up against them. And... Uh, uh, so this is what's going to happen to them. And then in 586 B.C., during Zedekiah's reign, Nebuchadnezzar broke through the walls at Jerusalem. The last thing he saw was the murder of his sons. Jerusalem was burned. The temple dismantled and its riches carted off to Babylon. Now, you remember, his riches are in Babylon because later on in Daniel, you're going to read about those riches. And they're going to do some crazy things and God's going to do some wonderful things there. Even in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. This king was evil and proud. Built one of the seven wonders of the world. God humbled. Remember, and you'll get to catch that later. He humbled him and he ended up like a cow eating in the pasture. Said his hair grew like feathers. His toenails grew long. And, and we'll pick up that uh, later on. But God doesn't forget his people. Here, even in the last verses, as we close, now it came to pass in the 37th year of captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, uh, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. For some reason, he let him out of prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. See, so that's a God thing. Why would a king take out an enemy and place him up above all of his other kings? He became more prominent. So Jehoiakim changed from his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by a king, a portion for each day all the days of his life. So God provided for him. So God took him out of prison. Sounds a little bit like Joseph, right? Joseph took him out of prison. Sounds a lot like me. I was held in the prison of darkness with sin as my master. And God took me out and placed me in his kingdom. And he's taking care of me for the rest of my life. Forever and ever and ever. Isn't that great? Lots of good stuff there. Uh, God would eventually... As we go through, God's going to bring Jerusalem, bring them back to Jerusalem. He's going to bring them back to Israel. Then they'll go away again. And then in 1945, wasn't it, Ron? 1940, 48, sorry, wrong year. Israel became what? A nation again. Because God is not done with Israel. And God's not done with you. No matter what's went on in your life, God's not done with you. God wants to use you to reach people for him.